Thanks, David. Thanks, David. We want to release the little kids to the nursery room, which is over here on the left. The rest of you are going to have to endure what I have to say for a few minutes. So we want to pray for you so you can go out this way right now for nursery. Lord Jesus, we just pray for these little souls that we claim for your kingdom, Lord God. We want each and every one of them to be touched by your spirit and to grow up to follow you in Jesus' name. And bless the Sunday school teachers. We got a video to play for you today, right? Nathaniel, you ready to go with that? So we're going to play a video. Um, So if somebody want to hit the lights for me. I'm glad you liked the video. It's really good. We sang a song, the first song we sang today. Do you remember what it was? It was called I Will Rise. I Will Rise. Um, Jesus has overcome the grave and um, has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He has risen from the dead and I will rise when he calls my name. So today I just want to not take very long because of the little children, um, but today I just want to kind of um, do something that's been kind of grating against my uh, spirit a little bit lately. I'll explain in a minute. Um, but you can put the first slide up if you want, um, Nate. I, I like slides and things in the background so that um, people don't have to look at me all the time. They can have something else to look at, which is nice. But uh, see the slide here we have? It says, uh, you're never going to let me down. We sing a song that like that, right? It says, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let me down. You think that's true or false? It depends on how you look at it, doesn't it? It depends on what you are expecting God to do for you. Expecting what, ex, ex, wonders what you think God is going to do for you. Because if your motivation or if your expectations are wrong or not of God's plan for your life, you're going to be let down. You're going to be. God's not going to let you down, but you set yourself up for it. So what's been grating against me is... Um, and I, and I really, I rarely ever do this. Um, I, I don't like to do it. I don't like to talk about any other doctrine or teaching or things out there. But there's something that's kind of out there that kind of hits us. And I believe that it sets us up for disappointment. I believe that it causes some real problems in, in our lives as Christians. And I also believe that it causes non-believers to look at us and think that we're a little crazy. And, and it, I don't think it helps in any regard. Years and years ago, this man came to our house, to Linda and our house. Um, he's about 32 years old. And um, now he needed the help of a, of a walker to walk around. He um, had a stroke when he was 32 years old. And he was an elder in a church in Massachusetts. And he was at our house because, his, this long story short, the, the church that he was from was what we call a faith church. If you have enough faith, you can do anything, you can have anything, you can achieve anything. 
They love the scripture that Jesus said that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say that this mountain be cast into the sea and the mountain is going to get cast into the sea. Pure as that, we don't need to look at any other scriptures. So when he had a stroke, they said, well, you need to pray against that stroke. So he did, and it didn't go away. The damage was done. He now needed a lot of help to get around. He was only 32 years old, and they eventually actually kicked him out of the church. He was an elder in that church, and they eventually said, you have to leave because you obviously have no faith. So, um, does that grate on me a little bit? Yes, it does. I have to admit, this, um, I kind of like have to ask God for patience in this area. But I want to read to you something out of James chapter 4. Um, ch James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Talk about quarrels and conflicts amongst us. James says, what is the source of the quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that weigh war with your members? Okay, so what's he talking about here? Your pleasures. It's your natural desires that wage war with you. Things that you naturally desire. Okay, so maybe you desire a really nice car or, you know, better health or lots of money. I don't know. You know, maybe you desire your spouse would treat you better. Whatever it is that you desire, these desires wage war against the things that God wants to do in your life. Not necessarily because he doesn't will some of those things for your life, but because that is where your heart is. That is where your heart is. And so he says in verse 2, you lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. Well, we're not all going around committing murder, but he's trying to make a very obvious point. And you are envious and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel, you do not have because you do not ask. But ah, verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so you can spend it on your pleasures. What's your favorite singer? Um, Janis Joplin, yeah. Oh Lord, please buy me a Mercedes Benz. You know, <laughs> she died of a drug overdose. So, um, you know, where was she coming from? You can see what's going on there, right? So then you have to say, well, then, Lord, if, if, my, if my motives are wrong and I'm asking for all of these things and I'm being disappointed, what am I missing here? What am I missing? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you don't really have to turn to it if you want to, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, Paul went before God and he prayed and he tells the Corinthians church this. He said, there's something that's been bothering me for a long time. It's a thorn in my flesh, he called it. People have been guessing, trying to guess what that was, some kind of sickness, whatever. They're trying to guess what this was. And he said, Lord, please take this from me. And he said, he didn't pray that just once. He prayed it three times. Lord, take this from me. And the Lord said to him, no, my grace is sufficient for you. I want you to go through this. I want you to bear this thorn in your flesh. Because there's something to be gained through our suffering sometimes. When God says, I will work all things out together for good to those who love God. He even tells us another place in Corinthians that God uses the comfort that we had to find to help to comfort other people in their pain. He says that. He wants you to learn that comfort so you can help to comfort other people. So if you never had to suffer, you never had to learn it. Genesis tells us in the story of Genesis that we are living in a cursed land. We are living in a world where evil has popped into place. And, and Linda and I went to see the movie The Shack yesterday, and it was, it was really good. It wasn't good the book. It was, it was good and everything. But... There, there was something that kind of aided me later on about the movie, and that is that even when they were talking about evil, they never really talked about the source of evil. That there is an evil one that is at work who loves to play on your pleasures and your desires, to get your mind and heart set on those things instead of the things of God. He loves to, to bring things into your field of vision to steer you astray. And people go and go and go on these routes until they end up in such deception. 
that, that there's millions of people out in that world that want to kill you if they had the chance to. They would love to kill you if they had the chance to. And they think it's what God wants them to do. I love those little signs, those peace signs on the back of the cars that says coexist. Because I'm sitting there going, I'm willing. But you need to talk the rest of the world into that. I'm willing to do that. But this world still reaps of the sins of other people. And when the Twin Towers thing happens, I'll, I'll just never forget. I went to, I went to my a chiropractor, and she literally said to me, if God is real, how could he allow such things to happen? And how many people do you think were in the Twin Towers were actually Christians that died there that day? I don't know. But there was a bunch of them. Because this lamb, we, God calls sin, sin. Because it hurts you and it hurts other people around you. That's why he doesn't like sin. It's not because he wants to make up a bunch of rules to make life hard for you. He calls sin, sin because it hurts you and it hurts other people around you. And when people sin around you, you will be hurt. And everybody who died in the Twin Towers got the reaping of the sin that was, that's in this world. So, if I got you really depressed by now, like you should be like, where is he going with this? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want you to turn to Psalm 27. This is as far as we'll probably go today. Psalm 27. This is David, who became King David. Psalm 27. It was really cold this morning. My wife actually asked me why the bird water feeder was frozen. I said, you know it's 11 degrees outside, right, sweetheart? It was really cold. Anyway, I'm saying it because I had about four cups of coffee because it tastes good because it's hot. And now I'm like wired. Yep. Psalm 27. If you found it by now, verses 1 through 3 said the, says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, my adversary, my enemies, they, they stumbled and they fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. And in verse 5, he says, For in the day of trouble... He will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And then in verse 10, My father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for fault witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. This is a key verse right here. I want you to underline verse 13. I would have despaired unless I believed that I would see the land of the living. I would have despaired unless I believed in the land of the living. Now look, this is my job to teach. I try to do it really good, so I'm like, what is the land of the living? That doesn't tell me anything. I'm not really sure what that means. So I spent an hour and a half going into a Hebrew um, concordance to find the Hebrew words for land and the Hebrew words for living, and then how they get translated into English. And guess what they mean after an hour and a half of doing this? Land means land. <laughs> Earth, ground, soil. And living means to be alive. To be fresh, be green, to be alive. I'm like, wow, an hour and a half down the drain. I, I have no idea what land of living is. But as I prayed about it, as I really prayed deeply about this, I don't call this the land of the living. Because we're surrounded by death. Whether we like it or not, death happens here. Yes, there's life here. Because Jesus came and his step, the earth had sin and evil brought into it. Jesus came to set us free and so that we can walk in his life 
and in His supernatural fruits and His supernatural gifts of the Spirit, we can have those things here on earth. But it doesn't mean we're not going to suffer. It doesn't mean we're not going to see death. Death has no sting because Jesus said, when I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And that place, Revelations, and saw in the video, has no pain, has no sorrow, and it has no death. That is our promise, folks. Look, I don't want you to get me wrong. If you're sick, if you feel God is telling you to pray for somebody or something and, and to really have faith and believe in that, I'm not going to stand against that. I'm going to, tell, I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray for you to get healed. I'm going to pray for whatever it is you're praying for. But eventually our promise is that he will raise us up on the last day. And if anybody knew about having problems, it was David because they sought to kill him all the time. When he said they wanted to devour my flesh, they wanted to cut his head off. Like ISIS people do now to Christians. They slice your head off. That's what they wanted to do to him. He slept in caves for day after day, and week after week, month after month. He didn't have a cot. You know, he slept in caves. He hid. And, and, and just all he could do, and in all of these places, he felt that God was with him and gave him victory. Would you consider sleeping in a cave of victory for your life today? If I had to sleep in a cave tonight, I would not be a happy person. No. I don't even like sleeping on the couch. Fortunately, Linda never makes me do that, so it's really nice. David knew what he was talking about. He knew the comfort of God wasn't necessarily being delivered from his circumstances, but was having God with him in his circumstances and having victory in them. And then he said, but even with that, I would lose hope, except I know where I'm going when this is done. That's the message. And that's the thing that people need to see. You know, I even forgot about the other slides, and don't, don't worry about them. I just got caught up in this. Jesus came to bring us life, to change our lives so that we can change other people's lives around us. Sorrow and pain and death has not been eliminated until he comes again. Now, that scripture that was on the video, Revelations 27, uh, I don't know, Revelations something. Anyway, it says, before that scripture, it says that there comes a day when Jesus will return. And when he does it, he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. This is all be changed. And this will be like heaven. And this will be the land of the living. And that is our hope. And that is our promise. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, we just come before you. And we're, um, we're just sorry, Lord, that we sometimes ask for for the wrong motives and ask for the wrong things and we get our mind and our eyes and our heart off of the things that you really want to do in our lives and how you really want to use us, Lord Jesus. And we just come before you and say, Lord, we're sorry. We want to grow up. We want to grow up into things, into your plans for our life. And Lord, we, will, we, will, we want to pray with faith in everything that you ask us to pray for. But we want to learn what Paul learned to the comfort that he received and the grace that was sufficient for him. We want to learn those things too, Lord, so that we can minister to those out there that are hurting people. We ask this in Jesus' name.